if you can just concentrate on every single day, how you'll provide value in your community, in your social circle, in your family, that will translate to making money. Hello and welcome to episode 174 of the Smart Agents Podcast. As always, my name is Michael Walter and I'll be your host. On today's episode, we are joined by Houston-based realtor Marnie Greenwood. Making a name for herself in the luxury market, Marnie has utilized her ever-growing sphere and expertise to sell one-of-a-kind properties, many times off the MLS. Throughout our conversation, Marnie shares how she broke into the luxury real estate market, how she communicates with sellers to have a steady supply of off-market listings, and how a focus on providing her sphere with more than just real estate knowledge is filling her referral pipeline. But before we get on to the day's featured interview, the all-new Smart Agents Magazine has launched and is full of insights and strategies designed to help real estate agents grow their businesses. Inside, you will find interviews and advice from leading real estate professionals, marketing tips to flood your business with leads, and even swipe and deploy files full of practical tools to enhance your business. Subscribe now to receive your copy of the printed magazine each month and instantly get access to our online agent community and members-only templates. Click the link in the episode description or go to smartagents.com forward slash magazine. Also, if you enjoy this conversation, be sure to like and subscribe. The Smart Agents podcast streams on all major podcasting platforms such as Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, and of course, YouTube. And finally, if you or someone else on your team has an incredible story or real estate tips to share with our community, send us a message at feedback at smartagents.com. We're always on the lookout for new stories to share. All right, let's get on to the day's featured interview with Marnie Greenwood. If you're interested in seeing more from her, I've included several links in the episode description. But really, the way I like to start all of our conversations off is if you could just introduce yourself to us a little bit, uh, who you are and where you're at in the country. Okay, I'm Marnie Greenwood. I am with Compass and I'm in Houston, Texas. Awesome. How long have you been in real estate? 15 years. Uh, What was it that got you interested in uh, the industry initially? Um, so original, well, before I was a real estate agent, I was a designer and, um, I designed jewelry and accessories and liked the whole design and creative process in 2008 when the economy went to sleep and nobody, um, was buying jewelry and accessories. I wanted to pivot to something different. Um, and I was, I wanted to stay something with business and with design aspects to it. Um, and also stay in touch with my clientele. So I had a pretty large following here in Houston. So it was an easy transition for me. Oh, that's nice. It is, it is nice to get into real estate already having that uh, that kind Name. of good sphere yeah. around. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so sure. Sure. when you when you first got into real estate, how did you uh, get that message out to your sphere that you had gotten into real estate and this is what you were doing now? Um, well, luckily I have four kids. Um, and so, you know, a lot of it was just word of mouth. I would say it really was word of mouth back then. I wasn't doing, um, much social media or anything like that. It would just be, I'm at football practice with one of my kids and people say, what are you doing? And, you know, so it was very natural. It wasn't a real, um, intentional way of getting the word out. Yeah, absolutely. I understand my son's in baseball and we are constantly kind of intermingled with the same probably 30 families, you know, all summer long and throughout the the whole process. So um, obviously over the course of your career, you've really uh, made a name for yourself in the Houston market and specifically in the luxury market in Houston. What Mm -hmm. was it that got you in, um, got you into that specific, um, you know, kind of subset of the market? Um, I think it really boils down to who you are around and who you know. So a lot of my clients from my previous business were clients that would fall into the luxury category um, home-wise as well. And so it was more my sphere of influence than me going out and trying to be a luxury agent. It was just that I was helping people I know and they happen to be in that realm. Right. So um, when you are uh, 
you know, working on a luxury listing, obviously the marketing is going to be very different than your standard, you know, maybe uh, neighborhood that has, you know, the cookie cutter style homes and things like that. So what are some of your uh, strategies for getting your listings out there uh, to a buyer base? Um, So early on, I, you know, would just do your regular flyers and, you know, started doing social media posts and then, Um, advertising in luxury magazines here in town. And then once I became more established, I became somebody that people come to for those listings. So Mm -hmm. agents will call me and say, do you have anything coming up in River Oaks? Or do you have anything coming up in Memorial? I have a buyer. Um, And so through consistent marketing, through all the social platforms, digitally, print, um, that's sort of a constant message, but I'm also known as somebody that has those. So people will call me as well and we'll do things like, Hey, you know, I'll get on Instagram and say, I have a really cool listing coming up in River Oaks. If you have anybody, give me a buzz. And it's, it's pretty organic that way. And again, it's just, it's kind of like marketing to the same sphere and the same people over and over again. Right. Um, I, rarely find myself marketing to like in the abyss, you know, like I'm targeting. So if people that are, you know, proven to buy in this neighborhood frequent X or they read X magazine, then I'm marketing in that magazine to get in front of those people. So it's a pretty um, targeted approach instead of like just a widespread pray and hope that somebody sees it. Right. Is that something that you started doing uh, right out of the gate or was there some trial and error before you found the specific places that brought you the best, uh, you know, results? Um, I think pretty, that's just how I approached it from the get go, um, mm-hmm. was to be pretty hyper local focused on whatever area that the listing was in. I would really target those people. You know, for example, if I had a, home that even just a first time home buyer might want, then I might target the luxury apartments right around there for people that might be looking to buy their first home. And, you know, these are people buying their first home for half a million bucks. So it's, it's, um, it's going as close to that listing as possible within the demographic that would probably buy that house. Right. And then you also, you mentioned how that, um, a lot of the the buyers agents they just know you and they they call you to ask you know right. what um, um, things exactly. you have exactly yeah right. so um, specifically I sold a house to a client just over a year ago and it was a six million dollar house and it was a a builder had it and then the um, I actually had the listing and the buyer. And the buyer came and customized it, made a fabulous house. They decided they want to move back to another area of town. Um, But they weren't really ready to put it on the market. They have kids. They weren't ready for everybody to know that they're going to sell so quickly. And so we photographed it to be ready Mm -hmm. um, for either when they were ready to list or in case somebody called me. And another agent called me from a different brokerage and said, do you have anything fabulous in one of these two neighborhoods? And I said, I do. And it's like drop dead fabulous. The price is six million, non-negotiable, you know, and I sent her the pictures and she said, they're going to want it. So we showed it to them one time. They made a cash offer, full price and sold. So never hit the market. And then I had other people here that it sold and other agents calling me saying, wait, why didn't you call me about that? I had a buyer. I had a buyer. Um, so, but a lot of that happens a lot of, you know, I'll have something in my pocket that somebody's considering selling, but they're not really ready or they know they want to move when their kids graduate and we'll just sort of put a little marketing package together. And if somebody comes to me, whether they're my buyer or somebody else's buyer, I'll say, Hey, you know, I I have this, it's going to be available in May. And a lot of times we get it sold like that. Yeah. So is that something that you have a conversation with your, and I have to imagine these people are, I'm assuming, you know, 
that these sellers are people that are within your sphere that have done business with you previously. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. but you know, when they start having those conversations with you that, Hey, we are, you know, looking to move, is that a, is that something that you are pretty quick to talk to them about? Hey, let's put together a little marketing package just in the case that I do have something that comes along. Yeah. Because it takes the pressure off, you know, and if they don't want to sell, we don't sell it, you know, but a lot of times if somebody is on the fence, they really kind of want to know, well, if I did sell, what would that look like? What could I get for it? And so with this particular buyer, I said, this is really pushing it, but let's put a 6 million price tag on it and let's see what happens. And they were like, wow, okay, we're willing to try that. And it worked. So they were willing to sell then for 6 million. If we went to market and we really did it only by the comps and it needed to be priced lower, then it would need to be at a time that was ideal for them to sell. But in Houston, we have a severe lack of inventory. Um, and so people are getting what they want. Even my buyers are paying over asking over and over again. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I can definitely understand how, uh, you know, from the, the seller's point of view, it does really take a lot of the pressure off when you aren't kind of on that time clock now of, okay, I'm ready to put it up on the market. I'm moving. I have to have this yes. sold to where, when, you know, offers start coming in, you can really decide, is this something I want? And also, if the the home isn't up on the market, you really can set your own price because you're not, you know, it's not yeah, up there. I mean, it's not it's up for- like you take it or leave it. And then if <laughs> you, they ended up having to go to market, their higher price was never exposed. So they're not going through reduction, 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 right. or and they're not accumulating days on market. Yeah, absolutely. And so when, you know, by getting those, uh, you know, those kind of, off market listings and, and getting, you know, those pocket sales, I, having good relationships with other agents, how big of a part is that to it's huge. Yeah. It's huge. Um, I've always tried to maintain a good relationship with any agent that I'm working with on the opposite side of, because mm-hmm. at the end of the day, we're all trying to get to the same goal. Right. And so if you're treating someone nicely um, the next time your name pops up on a listing, they're not like, oh, I don't really want to work across from her, you know. Right. Um, and if they're, if you're in a situation where there's multiple offers and I submit an offer and so do two other agents, if they've had a positive experience with me, then they're likely to say to their client, you know, when the client says, well, do you know any of these agents? Yeah, you know, actually, I've done a deal with her before and she's very kind and fair. And I think that helps my clients. Right. Absolutely. When you, um, for your listings that do, you know, uh, you know, eventually go to market, what type of uh, marketing packages are you putting together to really uh, highlight the, you know, the unique attributes of those homes? So um, I personally, in my office, I have hired a full-time marketing person that's not a licensed agent. And her entire job is to put together marketing packages specific to that home. So that spans from print, digital, social, and she'll do a deep dive into where that buyer is statistically likely to come from, what interests do they have, um, really pinpointing, you know, more than likely the type of buyer that's going to buy that house. And then Luckily, I am able to turn it over to her and say, you know, target the best buyer for this house. And then she'll do tons of reporting for our client and say, this is where all your listing has been shown. This is, you know, everything from this picture gets the most views. People spend the most time on this picture. And then we'll kind of you know, say, oh, wow, okay, everybody's loving this backyard shot. Let's make that the home shot on the multiple listing service, mm-hmm. you know, and and try to evolve with the data that we're getting back and then dive deeper into whichever seems to be working the best. Right. How big of an impact uh, and how immediate of an impact did you see uh, when you brought on a marketing person for your your business and you know what I would it did say for the this. main the main thing that that did for me was free me up to do what I'm good at you know mm-hmm. so so I would say immediately 
because instead of me trying to be a real estate agent and a broker and an advisor and a marketer, you know, that's, that's really two different jobs. And so realizing that and getting somebody that's excellent at that job, let me be excellent at my job and not be split between the two. So I would say immediately. Right. And then having somebody that is being, you know, is able to uh, bring the data to your Mm -hmm. sellers. I I have to imagine that has to help, um, help them make, you know, better decisions, but also feel a big part of the process when it comes to marketing their homes. Uh, And less emotional decisions. Right. So it's like, this is the data. And so if you want to know like why we're not spending money here and we're spending money here, it's because this is where your viewers are. You know, a lot of times before we had all of the access to this data, I would have a client say, well, why aren't you putting it in the blah, blah paper? You know, and that's, it's like, well, Joey, you're the only person reading the blah, blah paper anymore, you know, but if you have the data, it takes it, takes away the personal aspect of it too. Right. And, and even just, you know, the, the parts of being able to say, okay, this, this photograph or this portion of the house is like, that's really what's driving the traffic. It, you know, my family situation might be different to where maybe I didn't necessarily use that portion of the house, but that really is a big selling point. And if I didn't personally use it, I might not, you know, right. think of it as a big marketing right. point. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, when it comes to, uh, you know, retaining clients and keeping that, you know, referral business going, uh, what do you do uh, for the client retention and, you know, keeping relationships with folks beyond the transaction? So I think that is really, really key, really key. And I know a lot of agents that are really good about that for the first year, right? So they, they send them, you know, a one year house anniversary gift and, And then as time goes, they sort of fade off. But I make sure that every client going back 15 years, um, they get something from me every single year on their house anniversary, for sure. They, um, most of them are signed up to get a newsletter that I write called Mondays with Marnie. It has very little to do with real estate and more to do with life. And it has a really high readership percentage. Um, and I get, I stay in contact with people like that. Um, of course, birthdays, that kind of thing. Um, and then sometimes, you know, pick up the phone, just pick up the phone and say, Hey, what's up? How are you? Um, if you see somebody that's on Facebook and their daughter got into the university of Texas, you know, pick up the phone and say, Oh my gosh, how cool that your daughter got into the university of Texas. And just pay attention to what's going on in their life um, instead of making it about you, right? So like everybody, you know, just sold. Wow, look at my new listing, you know, like who cares? (laughs) You know, so staying in touch with people in a way that you're showing interest in their life or providing value, you know, like, hey, if you just want to know what the neighbor's house sold for, give me a call. I'll look it up and tell you. be a resource for data, a resource for all kinds of things. We send things out when people buy their home, like here are my favorite restaurants in the area. And then the next month, do you need a painter, an art hanger, a plumber? Here are people that we've used in the past Um, and just try to always provide value, but, but never stop just because you sold them their house 10 years ago, you know, well, now it's probably about time for them to move again, you know? So I think that's, that's another key. I do a calendar every year that has quotes on it um, that we deliver in a really cool box and um, we hand deliver those to, I don't know what, few hundred houses, like 200 houses and it's growing a year. And so people have this little calendar that's, you know, not cheesy and (laughs) that they might want to have out on, on their desk. Um, So that's another way that we do it. But a lot of it is just organic text. People pick up the phone um, and check on them. Right. And like you said, you know, going back to those people that have been your clients for 10 years, even if they're not the ones that are looking to move, 
by so that they point, their people. neighbors, their neighbors are definitely right. in that in that position. That's so, right. yeah. uh, and I love you know the hand delivering of things. I think the more uh, in person contact and personal contacts you can make, uh, the better. Apps for sure, and show up for people. You know, if somebody has something, um, and you're invited, go. You know, even if you go for just a bit, but show up for people and not and just. Try not to always be like, do you have business for me? Do you have a referral for me? But what can you actually provide to them? Right. Absolutely. And I, I was uh, reading your Mondays with Marty uh, and I really I, I love, you know, the layout of it. And really what you do provide uh, for people is a little bit of that, a little bit of everything going on inside your uh, neighborhood. When did you start doing those? Um, in COVID. So right at the beginning of COVID. So maybe three years um, and it started out as, so when I joined Compass, I don't know, five years ago, they produce a newsletter that you can go in. It's a template. You can go in, you put your picture, your name, your logo, and you can send it out to your sphere, which is a really nice, you know, thing for somebody to hand to you. Right. But in my sphere, especially in the luxury market, I'm like, everybody would get 10 of those if I sent that. out. So I thought, well, I'll just make my own and I won't make it about real estate. So I remember one of the first ones I wrote was called Sneaky Snake. And it was like during COVID when things started to slow down, you know, the person that's going to sneak up on you is yourself because you haven't paid attention to yourself because you've been running so busy. So now that you're slowing down, you're like, whoa, who is that? And it's you and you're having to face who you are and et cetera. So I started writing about just life, uh, which especially resonated during COVID because everybody was thinking, you know, more deeply during that time. Um, and then it just kept going and I get tons of replies and people like it. And it's just kind of a, a fun way. Sometimes they're funny. Sometimes they're, you know, just wisdom. You know, I'm 55 years old. I've lived a hundred years. So I'm like, <laughs> you know, you want to hear about it? kids, adoption, divorce, real estate, jewelry, right. fashion. <laughs> what do you want to know? I can probably <laughs> tell, tell you. Right. And that's a great way. I mean, it just is a, another really good way to connect personally with your sphere. Yeah. And so people it, like to hear you, you know, yeah. people like to hear like, Instead of, oh, it's so glossy, Marnie's, you know, on in the magazines and she's top 25 and she's this and that and your pictures are pretty. And it's like, well, you know what? I'm actually going through the same crap that everybody else is going through. Right. And people like to go, oh, cool. OK, I'm not the only one that is making tater tots and now putting Velveeta on them for, <laughs> for variety. You know, just like right. it's not all perfect. And I think it's that people like to know that. Right. Absolutely. And I really like what you said there about, um, you know, how you had the template provided to you, but you felt like I really want to make this my own. And I think that's one thing that, you know, a lot of people could benefit from is while there are all the templates and a lot of things and a lot of marketing materials that might be provided uh, via the brokerage or the, the company oh, yeah. that to really make sure that you are personalizing those to yourself. For sure. And also, but what that requires is a level of vulnerability that I think is, is a tough ask for a lot of people because they want to put this image of themselves as this like buttoned up perfect real estate agents that's there to handle your business. Um, and so to be vulnerable and make it your own, you know, it's almost like, okay, here I go. I'm going to throw this out there and let me see what happens. And I would just encourage everybody that if they're supposed, if they're your people, they'll, they'll get it and they'll appreciate it. And if they aren't your people, they never were your people. So, you know, I don't think you're going to run anyone off by being yourself. You might just attract the people that you're supposed to work with a little better. Right. And, and by attracting those people, those are the people that are going to be more likely to refer you out to more exactly. like-minded folks. And make and, your job fun. I mean, when you're right. working with people that are semi-like-minded, it is a lot, it's a lot less swimming upstream yeah. than working for people that are just not on the same planet. You know, that's, mm -hmm. that's a tough one. So mm -hmm. I, 
I'm myself and I attract whatever that attracts and it seems to work. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, so, all, the, all the crazies are staying together. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, you know, before we wrap up, I do want to, you know, having uh, the success you've had and then obviously, you know, being able to uh, launch your real estate career with the the sphere that you did have um, for somebody that uh, maybe is looking to get into the real estate industry or maybe moving markets, you know, clear across the country, maybe doesn't have that uh, big sphere. What are some of those things that you think um, they could do to really start uh, ingraining themselves within their community? Um, so I would say leave your office, you know, go volunteer, join a group, join a club, join a church, but you've got to become in the community, right? So like sitting in your office and cold calling or doing leads and not to bash Zillow and all the lead things. But to me, that's also swimming upstream. But if you go and you volunteer at anything, go to go somewhere that other business people volunteer, Right. So like, for for example, in Houston, Dress for Success is a really good place because it's a lot of business minded people that provide interview attire to people that are trying to get back on their feet and, and they prepare people for interviews. So you can volunteer helping doing resumes. You can volunteer in the wardrobe closet. And all of the people volunteering there are, are professional people like you. And so you have to start building a network within the community and then spread yeah. from there. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think, uh, you know, like you said earlier about how, you know, you're the people that you work with are, you know, the people that you're rubbing shoulders with every day. And I just know from even my son's baseball team, all those folks that we are around all the time. Those are the people that, you know, he's one of them is now my financial advisor. And, right. you know, so it just it, it does organically happen. Right. Exactly. And then also never be too good for, for any type of business. That is a, you know, that is such an important lesson, I think, for anyone who is, you know, they're growing or, you know, oh, they used to do leases, but now they don't do leases. Well, why don't they do leases? Well, because they're too good for leases. You know, I have, we're handling leases this morning. Right. So I have clients whose kids are moving back from college and they're trying to lease something with three roommates. Well, nobody wants them because they're right out of college. But if they have a good real estate agent that's known and we can write a good cover letter and help them, you know, you just help where you can help. Don't yeah. be too good or too big for anything. Right. Well, I and, help people. yeah. And in that situation, you know, I know a lot of it, it, it is, you're, you know, you're just simply trying to help somebody. But on the other side of it, you know, the roommates, those are parents that might not have worked with you before, exactly. but now that and those are all going to get married one day or they're all going to buy houses one day. So if you if you don't concentrate on the money and I know that's everybody has to worry about money, but if you can just concentrate on every single day, how you'll provide value in your community, in your social circle, in your family, that will translate to making money. And that's my best piece of advice for anybody is when I see agents run around here like, oh, my God, I don't have any listings. What am I going to do? You know, it's like, well, go do something. Go do something for someone else. And I guarantee you doing that over and over again, you will, the business will come to you. Right. Well, I, I think that's a great place to uh, to wrap it up. There's one of those good little wisdom nuggets. Oh, nugget. <laughs> 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 Absolutely. Well, I do really appreciate you taking the time to uh, sure. talk with me today. Yeah. Nice to meet you. I really want to thank Marnie for joining us today and sharing some of her insights on her success. Remember, if you'd like to see more from Marnie, I've included several links in the episode description. So once again, if you think you or someone else on your team has an incredible story or real estate tips to share with our community, send us a message at feedback at smartagents.com. Well, that wraps things up for this episode, but remember, follow the show wherever you listen to podcasts and make sure to subscribe to the Smart Agents YouTube channel. Again, I'm Michael Walter, and we'll see you on the next episode.